Hello, welcome to episode 15 of Free Kiwis, and today we're delighted... 16 this time. Oh, 16, 16. <laughs> episode 16 of Free Kiwis. We are delighted to welcome Jordan Williams, who is the General Secretary of the Free Speech Union. Now, the Free Speech Union has recently uh, developed out of its predecessor, the Free Speech Coalition. Uh, so perhaps a good place to start, Jordan, would be to talk about why that happened. I mean, I'm aware that the Free Speech Coalition itself was formed largely in response to the Auckland Mayor Phil Goth um, banning a couple of slightly obnoxious... <laughs> yeah, it's a slightly obnoxious Canadian YouTubers for, from public venues in Auckland. And, Canadians. And the, and the, oh, those Canadians. Anyway, the, the Free Speech Coalition took that on in, in the courts, um, but now they've become the Free Speech Union. So, so what's behind that, Jordan? Yeah, um, uh, thanks, Michael. Thanks, James, for, um, for, for having me. Uh, what happened was, it, I mean, it was frankly outrageous. that I'd never heard of these Canadians, and I know that some that, that opinions differ very widely in the union on the merits of any of their arguments. But fundamentally, these were some foreign speakers, provocateurs um, is perhaps a good d description, and we had the Mayor of Auckland saying, I don't like their politics, they are not to be using, I ban them from public venues. And I remember at work we were talking about how outrageous this was, and it rained absolute cats and dogs that weekend, and... I'd gone to the office to catch up on some work and obviously looking to procrastinate, I called um, a couple of uh, friends and um, a couple of mom's staff and said, look, it, it's not to do with work, I can't p pay you, but should, do you want to come in and we'll do a whiteboard session on this Phil Goff matter? Well, that was about 2 o'clock Saturday. Cut a long story short, by about 2 a.m. Monday morning, we had, um, we had a website ready to go, a legal structure, a bank account, and... Uh, on Monday morning, Chris Trotter came on board, mm. and we ne we knew we needed to be right from the beginning, um, uh, both bipartisan, but the perception of um, bipartisan across the political spectrum. And it was about a dozen people willing to put our uh, our name to it, and we went out publicly and said, "Look, if we can raise the money, we want to take this on. We think this is in principle wrong." You know, the Council of Civil Liberties um, weren't interested in sort of running the, the, the free speech line, and if we weren't going to do it, no one was. So by about midday Wednesday, we had fundraised uh, 100, 150000 I can't remember the precise amount, um, and a lot to do with um, Leighton Smith. He was very helpful in terms of promoting the cause, uh, and we were ready to go. Uh, we got to the high... Court, it took, oh, sorry, we got an urgent application for an injunction to the High Court, and it became very clear that, and I, and I it's normally, um, this is a very defamatory allegation, but it is so clear in the court documents, uh, that Phil Goff had just lied. He hadn't banned them. Uh, it was done independently. At, at worst, it was they were going to come to the decision anyway, but Phil Goff saw it as a political opportunity and grand, grand, grand standard. Uh, it was done on health and safety grounds on the basis of uh, a group of people or the particular venue was particularly vulnerable to, uh, to protest or to, um, to blocking off. And the council uh, officials in their wisdom, we disagree that they should have, but took the um, decision to cancel the event on that basis. So we were in the bit of a position where a lot of people had you know, chipped in coin for us to really um, uh, hold the mayor to account for, for being pretty outrageous. And after sort of consulting with particularly the people that had chipped in very generously, we decided to proceed to the full hearing. So we weren't going to get the, we definitely weren't going to get an injunction on just the health and safety ground, very difficult to convince a judge to overrule on, um, uh, on that sort of basis. Uh, and thought, no, actually, in principle, we can't be in a position where we have a New Zealander heckler's veto, where the misnamed Auckland Peace Action and groups like that are able to choose who ratepayers in Auckland can and cannot hear from on public venues. We did not do well in the High Court. We had a judge who labelled uh, our brave plaintiffs as taking this as a, I think he used the words, a personal crusade. Um, rather than a, a principled case that was literally funded by thousands of New Zealanders 
um, chipping in mostly small dollar amounts to get this off the ground. Uh, and off the goodwill of some more donations and a heck of a lot of unpaid time on part of our lawyers, um, who by this stage were pretty shocked with where the New Zealand law had got to uh, on the basis of that High Court decision, we took it to the Court of Appeal. The Court of Appeal uh, acknowledged that this was very much in public interest, um, quashed the High Court on its outrageous costs decision, uh, and said and basically gave us what we wanted in terms of the um, the principle that these are public venues. The High Court had said, "Oh well, it's it's sort of indirectly owned by the council because it's all in trust and it's all sort of operates commercially, sort of thing." Well, if operating a town hall for public meetings isn't a core government service, well, I don't know what is. Uh, but the, the the Court of Appeal certainly saw sense and agreed with us on all that, set out all the law correctly from our perspective, but then didn't apply it. They sort of took a little bit of a, we- of a um, not wheeze away out, but a, they basically said, look, uh, the event organisers should have been more upfront about how controversial these speakers were, and then the council possibly could have taken some more steps and, you know, earlier on. Now, we are seeking to appeal that to the Supreme Court uh, because, from a human rights perspective... It shouldn't depend on whether you have clean hands. You know, in, in, in law of tort, or sorry, mm-hmm. law and equity rather, you have to come to it with, with clean hands. Human rights don't work like that. Human rights are universal. What does clean hands mean in this context? It means that there's not fault on your side. And, you know, that you haven't... Um, the Court of Appeal basically said that the event organisers should have been more upfront, should have done... Um, uh, uh, be more proactive in alerting uh, Auckland regional facilities to the potential risks. Whereas our view is, is that, as I say, human rights shouldn't be conditional on you, you know, ticking all the boxes, sort of thing. Subsequent to that, of course, we had, and I mean, if there's one thing I've learned of late, it is that the law is just as much about perception of the law. Um, as what the law actually is. And the councils, I think, as a result of that High Court decision, felt quite invigorated to ignore freedom of speech. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then came along this uh, woman's rights speak group, up for Speak Up for Women, who uh, had this radical idea, or they're, they're labelled uh, TERFs, trans exclusionary <laughs> radical feminists, because they believe that if you were born a man... You're probably not a woman, even if you call yourself a woman, which we're not going to make any view well, any view on that issue. But uh, on the basis that the um, the Twitterati and the establishment object to that view, they got cancelled from various councils, and that was quite a straightforward case. And that was actually applying the guidance of the Court of Appeal in the Stefan Molyneux Phil Goff case uh, to this new fact situation. And we won pretty pretty spectacularly. We settled with Auckland Council for reasons we didn't go into, but the event was still held. You know, yep. at, a, at probably arguably a better council venue. Uh, and we absolutely decimated um, uh, Palmerston North, which were just absolutely outrageous. It was clearly politically motivated. They cancelled them. And then just around the country, the councils fought like dominoes. And because yep. there was a new, there's a new sheriff in town. And... Um, that's why, you know, going back to those original people that chipped in right at the beginning, it was to say to officialdom and to politicians, you know what, I don't want you to be controlling who and who I can't hear from. That's right. And mm. we certainly, we're taking the law, we have taken the law forward in that regard. Uh, we probably still want um, more, better duties around... Uh, if there are people that are outrageous and protest and threats violence and things like that, actually the costs of that should lie, that is a community cost, that should lie on the state in terms of defending the right of the minority, yes. it's controversial to speak. Um, what the problem is in Australia in this area is that when there's controversial um, events like this, the police end up sending the event organisers a bill. And those yeah. bills are, are, um, are six-figure often. Uh, is that we can't be in a situation where you sort of cancel it by the back door because we're loud protests 
um, forces costs onto those minority or controversial groups. Well, no, we don't expect the um, you know the victims of other kinds of crimes to pay for their own defence. We expect well, their own the, human rights. Yeah, exactly. So, so you know, if you, if you need to be defended from somebody who's trying to physically attack you, then the the public purse pays for that through police protection. So, presumably, we should expect the same for the protection of the of the right to to. to Speak your mind. Yeah, that's right. And that's certainly where the American jurisprudence is. Uh, the, uh, the New Zealand law is not as clear. The, the, we certainly invited the Court of Appeal to, um, to pontificate on this. They basically set out the alternate approaches of Canada and the US and said it would be up to New Zealand to pick a path but they didn't pick a path. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's one of the things that we'd really like some guidance from the Supreme Court on. Yes. And in fact, um, we actually got notification in the last few hours that we're going to find out whether we have leave. So the way it works from the Court of Appeal is you apply to the Supreme Court for leave, basically saying, well, you have to convince them that this is an important question of, um, uh, of law, um, in this case, or it's a particularly consequential case. Um, and convince them to, to, to pick up on it. Um, we will find out tomorrow whether, they've, um, whether they're going to pick up on it or, or not. Mm. And then that'll, um, we'll probably get a hearing in about six months' time. So it takes, it's, a, it's slow wheels of justice, but so far we've, we, we've taken the law forward. You know, we're not yeah. going to end up in a situation where a mayor is on Radio New Zealand saying, I don't like these people. I find their views um, uh, outrageous and I ban them. Or, 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 a vice, or a vice chancellor, for example. Yeah, well, that's obviously what we're going to talk today is around let, let's apply this to the, to, to, to the university um, concept. So you asked what was the story with the coalition? Yeah. We, as we have gone down this, um, this route, we've found that along the way we've had people approach us in an employment context. And it occurred to us that, you know, it was really the trade union movement that established the principle in the early 20th century that when you clock off after the eight-hour day, you are not still a servant of your employer. Mm -hmm. And what we're seeing more and more is people that have private views or they say stupid things on social media um, or, um, or, or involvement in controversial causes that is totally unrelated to work but seems to be creeping in to the mandate of employers. And that's... That is a union issue. That is an employment issue. Uh, so that's why we became a union. Yes. Uh, long term, um, we want to be in a situation where we can ride to the defence of um, of every member uh, on that on those particular issues. Uh, in the short term, and as we're growing, we want to develop the law in this area in the same way we did around the events. We and we certainly a lot of cases come along at the moment. We're only sort of been going a few months, but we've already had um, a couple which we can talk about. Um, but we know one will blow up and we will have to be, um, we, we will have to probably figure out, yep, this is the one, this is the one we think that we can take the law forward on because there's a lot of uncertainty in this. Mm. Employment law is inherently subjective and um, uh, factual based and it's all the test of a reasonable employer. Um, admittedly, and you've got some overlays in the academic world because you've got academic freedom and and things like that, and also arguably that um, the um, freedom of, um, of of speech or those human rights probably have an increased overlay when it comes to when the government's your employer, for example. All of these things we're really going to have to explore um, and take, as I say, take the law, law forward. In about a year ago, a group in the UK called the Free Speech Union, founded by journalist Toby Young, um, established itself. And we touch base with them, and they've been doing this now for, as I say, about a year. They're not a registered trade union in the way we are for some... Well, I won't bore you, I can go into it if you like, but the, the, the legal um, uh, test to become a trade union and what you've got to uh, um, stand for and what your purposes are is slightly is, is slightly mm -hmm. different in their law. Mm. Um, but of course, one of the protections of being a trade union is that it is illegal for an employer to discriminate against you or persuade you to not become a member or not become a member of a particular trade union. Yep. And one of our, and this shocked me when it happened, 
But one of our early members, um, quite in, very involved with us, an academic at a uh, university, was um, pretty much shown the door on the basis that she took a, despite being Māori herself, took a uh, more classical view of the interpretation of the treaty and as part of this process was also said that her involvement, quote-unquote, in that free speech lot was not appropriate for an academic. And that really shocked me. Um, I think part of being a trade union is that that's now unlawful. Yeah. That you can be involved in a and and actually, we won't we we, we we're not going to be the the um the, the most uh, d- uh, destructive or uh, not destructive um uh, disruptive trade union, but certainly if push comes to shove, we have now the legal entitlement to organise and um and go on to employers' property, including universities. Uh, and and do union business. And that might include next time, say, Don Brash is banned, you know, that that person who came within a few percent of becoming Prime Minister only 15 years ago, uh, next time someone like Massey University bans him for something that he might say, despite being on campus to talk about being Reserve Bank Governor, yes. um, well, we might very well host a union-organised event on that university. At which um, Don Brash might be a speaker. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. He might be mm. a, a um, um, part of that um, uh, a union union speaker. And I'm not going to make apologies for that because I just see time and time again this, and let's call it for what it is, bullying. Yeah. By, I, I, you know, so. I mean, I think it was a strike of genius becoming a, tr- a trade union, actually. Uh, and it, uh, it's interesting to hear you frame it in terms of this sort of growing issue with employment because it's true of course and one of the things that actually is worth exploring a little bit is what free speech really means um, I guess sometimes especially from a libertarian perspective actually it's interpreted a bit legalistically which is to say that the state may not abridge your free speech but mm. if mm. private individuals do well that's their business because it's it's on their front lawn kind of thing yeah, Congress um, will make no law, right? It says in the First Amendment to the United States Constitution. Right, so that that that, that brings in the, the American view of it. And that, and that, I think, is an interpretation that is sometimes taken here as well, that as long as the state is leaving you alone, then what happens in the private sphere is a different matter. Yeah. But actually what that misses to me is the fact that free speech is a fundamental value of open society. And, and if we don't fight for it, in private as well as public, then it's lost. And I don't think that we can um, legislate for it entirely either. I think that it it does have to be held as a value. Uh, But that doesn't mean we shouldn't fight for it through the courts when necessary. But in the end, if it's not held as a value in a majority of the citizens of an open society, that open society won't endure. You've absolutely nailed it, Michael that this is a um, one with the legalistic way and you sort of look at a sort of, I sort of think of it as a gradient that we must stand an absolute free speech absolutist when it comes to the relationship between the, the state and the citizen and the public institutions like universities. Mm-hmm. And you sort of work down that, um, a, d- a debate that the council have been having at the moment is... Um, these billboard companies, you know, the the this is more the sort of less legal but more cultural aspects of town is that people complain about um, offensive billboards, and now it's it's not even offensive. We've had in some other dictionary work, definitions of woman being on a billboard. That's one, but even things the test appears to now be controversial. That would be controversial. We wanted to put up um, for my. Um, work at the taxpayers union a picture of the prime minister was basically the meme of about making the point about the mongrel mob funding mm-hmm. and the the company said no nah, it's controversial and after the speak up for women taking down the billboard of the dictionary definition for women they've clearly decided we don't want any th- involvement in anything we're going to get complaints about now that that splits your liber- libertarians you can talk about <laughs> libertarians <laughs> about, about, uh, debating among themselves 
is that no, that's a private contractual relationship. It's not our role, anything like that. Okay. Some other libertarians say, well, hang on, is it, have, is it a little bit like the common carrier duty sort of thing, like in the way that the postal service it can't pick and choose who it provides services to because it's the common carrier, because it's a natural monopoly, etc. You could argue, and this is certainly where there's a lot of debate in the US, that something like Facebook is now effectively the common square. Yeah. And is, for example, I mean, the, the news, and this is actually what it was about, is that billboards have been taken down the last few days because of a group that um, they're called uh, uh, Voices for Freedom. Okay, so one of their issues is um, is uh, vaccinations, and they have a reputation for being anti-vax, but they put up billboards simply pro-free speech. The message was fine. You couldn't describe it as offensive. It definitely wasn't the breach of ASA, and even the billboard companies have said, oh, yeah, your message is fine but it's coming from you. Sorry, what's ASA? Um, Advertising Standards Authority. Thank you. Uh, uh, but it's coming from you, and we don't like some of the other stuff you stand for, which personally I find really alarming mm -hmm. to be saying that you don't have the right to run a billboard campaign to hold the government to account or to make whatever message you want to make because we don't like what else you stand for. That, to me, is very chilling. Indeed, you know, indeed. I mean, eject on the ad, you know, I talked about that that we've had some trouble with some of our ads because that that's one thing. But that's basically, I mean, yeah, I, I find that that actually is, I'm right, that is bigoted. Yes. To take, to take that approach. But, see, that is, you mentioned that it's not just legal, it's cultural. A lot of that's cultural. Mm. And so the role of the free speech union, and we've got to navigate that, is... Okay, so we occasionally have to go to the courts and ask for the adults to, you know, push through the the the, the, the Twitter noise. And we saw with the Speak Up for Women that judgment said, look, no, re there's no, I think it was no reasonable basis for calling Speak Up for Women a hate group, notwithstanding all the rap you read online. And that occasionally we're going to have to go and, you know, seek. They're not as reliable as you'd hope, but seek the adults in the room, i.e. the courts, to to wade through the stuff and get to, you know, get to the, the solid foundation of what the freedoms that we have we should have in our society. But also, we've got to promote not just this concept of freedom of speech, but I think a better way to think about it is actually tolerance. Yes. It's tolerance to hear the other side. You know, our maxim we use the Maori and the Latin maxim interchangeably is here the other side, is, it, is the translation. And that can be uncomfortable. And one of the things that I get very concerned about, and particularly recently in the academic world, is this projection of ill will onto people or evilness or, or racism. Manichaeanism, or, you'd call it. Yeah, yeah. Of The, the division <laughs> of the world into black and white. But the, what I stand for is good and correct, and what you stand for is bad and evil. Yeah, the, yes, correct. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's it's like an ethical um, judgment for having a point of view of which I don't disagree with. Oh, sorry, which I disagree with. And that fundamentally is what I think polarism is about in terms of we're seeing this increased polarism in our politics across the Western world for which New Zealand, I think, we've been extremely lucky not to have, and it really saddens me we're seeing that more and more. Mm. But that's tolerance, you know, yeah. and and some, I mean, I, I recently, um, Matt McCartan joined um, the Free Speech Union, and I, I think we owe, in terms of the this hate speech legislation campaign, which has been our main focus of activity over the last six or eight weeks, you know, we owe a huge debt to him because he would have come, no doubt, like Chris Trotter, under a lot of pressure from the woke left or the people that are, that, that are particularly vicious in this area, to say, actually, this fundamental is far more important than politics. Yes. And, uh, and I, I mean, I said, someone complained... Um, that uh, what are we doing getting into bed with um, with with Matt McCart? And I said, are you kidding? 
think about it from his perspective, him getting into bed with me. That's right. I mean, that's that's the, and, that, that, and to borrow a word from the left, you know, he's our comrade in this. The, yeah. It is actually, and it's that kind of thing. It's a, it's a fundamental fight for our society. And so, you know, people like Chris Trotter and, and, and Matt McCartan are absolute allies in that. Daphne from Speak Up for um, Women, very clearly of, um, uh, uh, of the left. And, and if you'd have told me two years ago uh, that I'd run a trade union or be involved in a trade union for which Judith Collins, David Seymour and the former leader of the Alliance Party and Labour Chief of Staff, Matt McCartan, are all members of, I would not have believed you. Um, but, that I mean, as I said to this uh, chap who, who objected, that if this is a, turns into a left-right issue, we're stuffed. Yeah. yeah. It, there is no way that we can have a flourishing or healthy democracy if free speech is divided into a left-right issue or becomes part of this cultural um, polarisation. And at the moment, it takes far more courage, for, for, as you've alluded, for people like them to, yeah. to to join up because for whatever reason, and that's an interesting thing in itself, the the defence of free speech seems to have fallen largely to, to the right and under assault from certain elements of the left. But as people like Trotter and McCartan demonstrate, certainly not the whole left, and in fact, they've clearly got some sorting out to do on that on that side of the aisle. Well, but Chris Chris tells me he's old enough to remember when the le- the the free speech was a left issue. Even I'm, I'm old enough, enough to remember, to remember that. that. Yeah, yeah, it's not that long ago. Well, like. I, I mean, I'm old <laughs> enough to remember as well. That, I mean, because we were talking about culture and the law. I'm old enough to, old enough to remember when the left was slightly better. I mean, maybe even the left was significantly better on free speech issues in the '90s. But basically, there was this general agreement that free speech was important. And, and sometimes the right would sort of not do very well on that front, but if you uh, alluded to that value, they would, of course, have to at least pay lip service to it, right? Mm. And, and now we're even getting into a realm where even the mere mention of the term free speech, you know, people will scoff at it. So it's interesting we're talking about uh, culture and the law because um, th- that's, I think, the most dangerous thing. And it's particularly in Commonwealth countries because I think, because um, I grew up in Canada and, and Britain, and I'm not a lawyer, but my, my sense of the, the, the law in these two countries on free speech is that it's not quite as uh, secure as it is in um, American jurisprudence, for example, because there you have the First Amendment. The Constitution is very hard to change. And everything basically goes through the Constitution. Um, so, you know, that's great. Um, in the Commonwealth, I think when I was growing up, there was the sense, yeah, there are some laws on the books. And it, you look back now, even in New Zealand, and look at some of these laws and think, wow, we had that law that was actually, that could have been dangerous. It could have been used against free speech. But, it, but it, uh, in general, they weren't used that often. And, and well, a key example are actually blasphemy laws. You know, they had blasphemy mm-hmm. laws in exactly Ireland until very, very recently. Yeah. And what happened is just that the culture moved so far away from actually using blasphemy laws that it was almost an afterthought to repeal it. They repealed yeah. them basically just to clean up the legal structure, not because anyone was actually uh, at threat uh, you know, of, of being and accused it was of cultural. blasphemy. The, 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 you know, Parliament is downstream of society. That's right. And blasphemy laws was so offensive... To the um, you know the the moral code of our society, that it was I'm I'm ninety percent sure it was Labor that repealed them mm. in their first term of, of, of government, and how this is the the irony with these. I think it might have been the Clark government that was repealed it that early. Them. No, I'm pretty sure it was Andrew Little. Um, I need to, as a, as I say. In right. any case, we're going to now years introducing later. them in the back door, exactly, <laughs> in the back door with hate speech legislation mm. because mm. it is the same effect. It is that test of, of hatefulness, um, i.e., offence, uh, uh, include you know, in the in, in subjective, not objective, yeah. but even objective. Well, and, and especially when they're talking about religion being a protected category. Exactly. I mean, how exactly do they intend to distinguish between? You know, hating on someone for being a, a Muslim, and just criticizing Islam. You know, it, the latter of which would be just blasphemy by another name, right? So, yeah, I and mean, it's also sh- something that surprised me in the last few weeks is the extent uh, of of which the minority groups that have engaged with the Free Speech Union point out that there is often very fierce debates within minorities. Of course. Different schools of thought within Islam. Yes. I mean, the the uh, horrible truths that the Catholic Church have had to, do- have, have had to deal with 
in the last generation would be one of those. Mm-hmm. And that uh, there'd be a lot of groups in New Zealand that rightfully look at tools like this tend to be, you might come in with the best of intentions, but one can be used very easily by those in power against minorities. We've got one historical lesson. And two, simply who is in charge there, the censors, whatever um, wh- whatever form that may take, can innocently get it wrong. And I think that's what Math- Math- um, McCartan's key point is, is that you don't know the truths of the next generation. And in order to get there, you've got to have really hard, awkward, offensive conversations. And that is the essence of democracy. Yes. And it's that tolerance and understanding that's what gets me up in the morning to yeah. work for this cause. And we have a very bad record and, and uh, on this. And by we, I mean the human race. <laughs> it's a really bad record uh, of thinking, oh, of course, you know, Christianity is the truth. Of course, Islam, this particular interpretation of Islam is the truth. Of course, gay people, you know, shouldn't be allowed to do, wha- do what they do. Of course, we should ban them, you know. And then a few years later, ah, actually, that was terrible what we did. Um, and, you know, the only way out of that is to actually be open to people putting forth different ideas, putting forward heresy. different ideas. I mean, or heresy or... The, the value of contrarians in society. Mm-hmm. And actually New Zealand has a proud history of contrarians. It's, I think it's in its bones a pretty conservative society. Um, and there's something about a conservative society that seems to me produces oddball con- contrarians. And yeah, and the, the trouble is when you drive it underground, I actually think you achieve the very opposite Indeed. of what you're trying to, which mm-hmm. is that social cohesion. And, mm. and there was a about oh, a couple of hours ago, our office on LinkedIn Key, um, there was a protest and it was during our our, um, our work in progress meeting and we all sort of went, left our chairs to look out the window and it was a, it appeared to be an anti-vax group. But a lot of the, it was, well actually, it was a, it was a licorice all sorts of sort of, um, a, um, what's that, Jamie Lee Ross party, a lot, um, not a lot. Um, oh. Uh, I've forgotten, but uh, <laughs> a brief, a brief. Yeah, it's good. It, it, it demonstrates how much, yeah, how yeah. much bandwidth they get in my mind. But the, but it, one of the things that a common theme of the banners was the stuff you often see in the US, and it sort of reiterates the point. I worry about our polarization, but that mainstream, MEC mainstream media is BS or, or lies or the, um, you know, wake up people sort of thing. And I've just not really seen that before in, in New Zealand, especially a march of a couple of hundred. They probably had three or four hundred people, actually. It was reasonably um, re- reasonably big. But the thing is, is when you suppress even really dumb ideas, that is sort of, you inherently fuel the conspiratorial-type minds yes. to go, I think, into pretty dark places. And actually, you want an example of us getting it wrong? Uh in six months ago, hmm. if I had have said publicly, I would have been absolutely ridiculed, and I'm not saying going to even say what what I think to be true. But if I had have pontificated that perhaps COVID came from a lab, uh-huh. I was thinking I precisely the same thing. <laughs> absolutely smashed. Now I don't actually I don't know the answer to it. We don't know the answer, but but, it, but it's certainly a plausible it's, theory, yeah, right? Exactly. There it is, is there it's is now a, legitimate. There is a virus enhancement lab in Wuhan, and, and very they were respectable working on people have pointed out right. that it is possible it is a lab. Now I've got no, I'm a, I'm a lawyer. <laughs> Who can say? I've got no idea. But isn't it interesting that it took quite a lot for that to even be? I mean, I would not have said that in New Zealand six months ago. And you look in the UK at the sort of, they've got a lot more media depth sort of thing, but um, one of the things that I totally disagree with Toby on this stuff, but Toby Young, the, my equivalent mm. in the in UK, UK yeah. runs his sort of, um, you know, I, I moonlight doing this, he moonlights doing um, something called um, Lockdown Skeptics, which is a, is what it says on the can. Yep. That's a sort of contrarian view on, on the COVID stuff. And I just think it's so good that in the UK, he's not... I'm sure he gets a lot of stick about it. Fairly but you're not sort of, Yeah, but you're not sort of written off in the same sort of way 
because there's just a little bit more tolerance of diversity of thought? I think in even? larger countries, it's just easier to sort of find other allies and other milieu, whereas in New Zealand, you know, everybody knows each other. So I think it's... Yeah, possibly. It's yeah. also a wider range of media. And that, I think this is, a, this is another cultural element that we need to address. So when I was a kid... Um, the media, by and large, especially, you know, the ma- it was a lot smaller than it is now. That When I was a small kid, there was one TV station and there was the nightly news and there was, there was you know, Radio National as it was back then and they'd have news bulletins. But they didn't have a, a line. They would just tell you what had happened or, or they'd be interviewing and ask hard questions irrespective of who they were interviewing. Mm. They didn't editorialise. That that would not have been seen as a legitimate journalistic practice. Whereas now, they they will shut down things based on their own views. Yeah, I think I think that's a. I think I've said it, um, on this topic. I've said in the past that it is a cultural issue that journalists are now taught that it's okay to campaign. It's okay to be virtuous. We're all about, you know, ripping open the truth and seeking getting justice sort of thing, rather than a sort of mechanical role of here's both sides, you respect the reader. Mm. But I think it it, it could be something to do with that, but it might actually be something quite um, accidental, and that is that newsrooms are now predominantly really young authors. So I'm, I'm 35. When I walk through... I used to say this when I was 32. Um, <laughs> when I walk through the Herald newsroom to walk into the ZB studio, I feel damn old mm. because the people that are in that room, with, there's a few exceptions, but it is now mostly t- early 20-somethings, recent grads, very much a Ponsonby, I could be, you know, latte-sipping worldview, that really generates our something. news without that sort of layer of old school sub editors mm. sort of being that that filter that doesn't really exist anymore, and it's partly driven by the fact that everything's now twenty four seven. It's really quick. You don't have the sort of cool heads of it's a newspaper for the n- next day, uh, or, or, or reflection or things mm. like that. So naturally, I think that sort of comes through. I think that drives a lot this sort of rural urban divide. That simply the provincial papers. I remember doing. This was years ago, but doing an interview for the Wanganui Chronicle for an NZME journalist who was sat in Wellington, uh, sat in Auckland, and had never been to Wanganui. And now that says something about a media, but I'm I'm really just focusing on that age thing because I think that has a lot to do, and I suspect that's around the Western world. Um, online means instant, but it also means that there's less of that sort of reflection and sort of wise heads or. Yeah, I mean, recently uh, David Seymour said that uh, John Tamahari wrote a wrote a column which is very critical of him, and David Seymour says that he wrote a reply to this and stuff turned it down be, uh, according to them because of its tone, and I, I found that quite shocking. I mean, whatever you think of David Seymour, the polls suggest. I mean, it's not only the polls; he's in Parliament. He's in one of the you know parties that are in Parliament. You get a certain lo- you should get a certain amount of legitimacy just from that. Um, and the idea that you can't even sort of defend yourself against a public attack in a, in a newspaper is oh, quite stuff something. Are, stuff are just terrible. I, I, I have tended to... I don't, we don't want to declare war with, with media companies because, you, know, you know, they still buy ink by the barrel. Um, uh, but stuff on freedom of speech are just terrible. Yes. We get, some of the ads we've done, which are not that bad. In fact, even, um, even ones to hold Trevor Mallard accountable for all the money that was spent defending him for, for falsely um, accusing someone of rape. This is obviously my TU job. Um, mm. um, stuff just wouldn't run. They, they, in fact, they even stopped running ads that previously run without any complaints. It, it is just... And it hacks me off that these guys turn up with the begging bowl to the oh. crown. And yeah. yet... And I'm forced to spend m- tens of thousands on Facebook because I can't give it to newspapers. Yeah, so I, I, I mean, I take your point that, you know, the age of journalists has something to do with it, but I think the stuff example demonstrates that it doesn't have everything to do with it because, you know, it's not the 20-somethings who own stuff. And, and actually there's editorial 
It's a it's a piousness. It's a yes, piousness yes, it is looking down the nose of and it, of and it goes to what you were saying with. before about about casting them as villains instead of just people Which you disagree with. I've got a really good example of that. The firearms community, when they were in the um, debate with the government on the extent of the buybacks and all that sort of regulation, uh, but the spokesperson had represented New Zealand in um, target shooting wanted to run full-page ads about, you know, the firearms community. And the paper said, I, I think this was actually said me, well, we're not going to run any ads with pictures of kids, pictures of the flag, or pictures of any firearms. <laughs> and you wonder why, there's a, why rural communities think you guys don't reflect us. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and possibly because, new, I mean... Um, you know, I grew up in, in provincial New Zealand. I, you know, but, but I was still connected through family to you know the farm. Uh, but the uh, the media certainly do not help themselves and you know first to call out sort of the polarisation. I am, am very conscious um, from in the work that I do that I'm probably going to be the first to be blamed when, you know, the polarisation of politics arrives, or if, if it hasn't, hasn't already. I think and it has. Yet, and yet we're in this horrible prisons dilemma mm. that actually, you know, to access audiences, you sort of have to turn mm. online and through alternative channels. I mean, the sort of the, the, the blossom here is actually what we're doing, is sort of semi-professional podcasting and yeah. things like that. And I know a hell of a lot of um, of boomers that sort of well, the Waikato Times or the Hawke's Bay Today or whatever no longer or maybe actually Hawke's Bay Today is not too bad, but certainly the stuff publications for which there's huge values in in the likes of um, the Waikato Times that just now do not reflect lecture their readers. Yeah. Um, uh, and we wonder why the sales are plummeting. But I think what they think is, you know, because there's this new environment, all these new technologies and everybody's doing a podcast or has a Twitter account, they sort of think, well, you know, this is just our brand and we're stuff. I mean, of course, they sh if they're getting public money to be a kind of that's neutral the, observer. The they should actually be a neutral observer. But, but it, I think it is true that a lot of people are thinking, well, okay, then the Free Speech Union can do its own podcast and they can have David, David Seymour yeah, on they, there. They were doing it's excellent. Well, it's, that was excellent. <laughs> I've been listening to it. <laughs> that's true. But I mean, but the results of this, um, if you just play this out, and I think it's already played out to a large extent in the States, is that you get this great fragment, uh, fragmentation of society. You know, yeah, and exactly. it's tough because actually I sort of sympathize with the view that in the old days it, was, it all went through a single funnel. And that could be a problem too, right? Because of people control. It was a principled funnel. Well, that, we could, that's the claim. And I mean, I think but that's sort of 80%. It had the craft of journalism behind it. Yeah, I, mean, I think that's sort of 80% right. We talked to Carl right, Dufresne on this yeah, podcast yeah. Um, a while ago. And, and this was yeah. his big thing about, I mean, he's a, a veteran journalist, of course. He, he was editor of the Dominion before the, there was the Dominion and Post. He was called a racist by his, for, by his former paper. Just oh, for, yeah. for something that... that yeah. yeah that anyone of our parents' generation would never refer to as racist. Of course. And, and so, you know, he, he was pointing out that you learned journalism from older journalists who tell you, you know, you need to go and change this. You can't be peddling your own view here. You've got to, mm -hmm. you know, play it straight. And, and I, I think, you know, James has got a fair point that it was a, a narrow funnel, but... It was so also there, there, there were things you couldn't say back then, of course, as well. They're, oh, they're, yes. They were yeah. different. But, I mean, yeah, now it's yeah. a very different environment and you have this extreme fragmentation. And I think that leads to the polarisation because, you know, as many people have pointed out, there's the risk that you just listen to this podcast and yeah. you get all your That's views right. from that and you go down this kind of tunnel. New, um, Ze New Zealand's unusual in that we don't have, and this is sort of going a little bit wider, but we don't have the what I call sort of the small C conservative mainstream publication. And what I really fear with pretty much almost without exception, everything tending to the centre left in New Zealand, I'm sorry to look through it. Or, f or further lens, left. But, um, mm. Is that we may end up with something really spaceball crazy on the right. Oh, yeah. And that, that really worries me. Same. Um, mm. uh, because that will just drive that polarisation um, mm. uh, polarization further. And I'd look at the model of you know, the Australian, the Telegraph, the Spectator, the. What is it, the National Post? And yeah, Canada. that's right, yeah. You know, that not spaceball crazy, mm. but simply covering news stories, and I am very much 
I don't think we're short of opinion. Like with the online, it's easy to get opinion. But it's stories that don't fit the narrative or editorial lines of most of our outlets. That means there are good stories or public interest journalism and stories that just aren't being covered. Mm. Um, but it, it, anyway, the, the fundamentally, though, this comes back to this idea of tolerance and you know the the events of the last few weeks or and that's happened in the academic world yeah i sort of think that that is that which is cultural not legal yeah. is that reduced um uh respect for each other collegiality whatever you want to want to call it but tolerance for views mm. that i disagree with and that, that always used to be the way with the academic world so so let's turn to that now because we used to be able to sort of depend on this Collegiality, of course, you can't romanticize um, the past too much, and there were probably you know there were some ructions in the past, but it's gotten a lot worse, and so now we uh, we're at the point where we really have to sort of think about laws and regulations and things. So the 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 scenario in universities at the moment is a little bit complicated because, as I understand it, there are laws in New Zealand uh, such as the Human Rights Act of 1993, where I believe it stated pretty, and there's an earlier law too where it stated pretty clearly that ac there is academic freedom. You have the freedom to express yourself. Uh, you, know, on, you have freedom to have certain views, and you also have the freedom not to hold certain views. You have the you have the right to silence. I believe that's also true, and I think this has been reviewed very recently. Okay, so that's on the one hand. On the other hand, if you work in a, in a modern university, you're also aware that there are things. For example, like when I signed my contract with Vic eight years ago now, I was actually finishing off my PhD in the States, and I read uh, you have to respect. Uh, part of my contract was to, to respect the Treaty of Waitangi which I quickly looked up on Wikipedia because I had never been to New Zealand before and hadn't heard of it. So, so that's interesting. So, you know, um, th that is something that academics have to be aware of. And then, then there's a question of you know, what, is it, what exactly does that mean? Can I talk about different interpretations of the treaty? Yeah. Would that be seen as disrespecting? Uh, and so you can see how this isn't one of those things you can kind of see where they're coming from and why they would want, you know, because the treaty has been, has been treated as a fundamental part of New Zealand law and society. And there are other things, you know, if you go around campus, you see posters. We, we, Beck is, um, Victoria University has a no-tolerance approach to racism, to homophobia, to transphobia, various things like that. And again, you can see where they're coming from. Um, but then, th of course, the problem is, you know, <sighs> these are subjective terms. People have different interpretations. So, so what happens, you know, if I'm in a lecture and I use a certain word and somebody says, oh, I think that's racist or, or whatever, um, and the university, there are people in the, in the university too who work in offices to do with things like disability and, and uh, diversity. So wh I guess what I'm asking is if push comes to shove in these cases, you know, imagine you're an academic and you're under fire. Let's say you, you think you, you haven't said anything particularly egregious. Um, the university is telling you we have these guidelines. H how does that, w w if push comes to shove between that and the, and the legislation protecting academic freedom, who comes out on top? You know, I think that it's... I am seeing more and more things that are actually reasonable minds can differ on. They are political issues, the meaning of the, the interpretation or approach to the treaty being a classic example is political. What counts as science perhaps being another? Well, yeah, the, the other one I thought of is, is actually the on the transphobia matter. That was the refreshing comments from the court that actually uh, this is a political issue, that he doesn't, the judge doesn't say that, you know, reasonable minds can differ, but it's clearly identified this is a matter of, of politics or political... Um, uh, um, public debate. Yeah, yeah, public debate, or um, I was going to say um, a worldview sort of thing. And actually, you can't just dress up a particular approach or your favourite approach as something fundamentally, as a you know, in the cornerstone terms of um, of um, um, human rights or you know that that sort of thing. That's what I mean by sometimes you have to go to court and sort of scratch through the noise to find out what is uh, what is underneath. The very difficult to give really clear. Um, black and white rules mm -hmm. in this area because one, the sands are always changing, uh, and two, these are often new areas where the law is um, is unexplored, which often it's around um, the cultural uh, the cultural stuff. I'm not an academic. Mm -hmm. um, my background is public law, but I do 
think of the been thinking about what's going on in universities and the, again that um, projection of ill will of evilness or whatever on people with views I disagree with and it doesn't touch wood I've not seen it in law mm. lawyers understand that we can have enormous fights but we also understand that when you have a client you develop a rapport and you naturally think as humans that your guy's the good guy that you're on the side of virtue and the other side isn't and yeah. you'll go into battle but we are collegial or have the appreciation that the other guy probably thinks the same thing and at the end of the day even if we even if you have a client and you can get this where you think that they are not on the side of virtue we understand that actually the principles the um, the uh, process and the um, what we're working towards is so important and our role in that right that actually at the end of the day we can go and be collegial or have a beer and, and this is actually part of a, a bigger picture which has to do yep. with the contest of ideas in yep. an open society and and I can think of at least three venues in which that is formalized and one is the law because it's built into the adversarial legal system that yep. you have a prosecution and a defence and they battle it out yep. and they and each the understand the role of the other in yep. that. And what they're actually fighting for is due process, yep. is, for, is for an outcome to emerge from that process. And, and that process can be quite ugly right? in the, in the midst yes, of... Yes, it can. And, and here's another one. Democratic politics. Our parliamentary system has a government and an opposition. It is the role of the opposition to hold the government to account, to, if you will, disagree with it, not necessarily because of personally held views, but because that's the role that you're playing as, as an opposition member, is to hold the government to account. Yeah. And, the, and the third venue is scholarly debate, and that is the, the province of the university. So within a university, you have scholars within disciplines who vehemently disagree with one another and in the past would see each other as colleagues with whom they would socialise and, and see one another's good points and enjoy, in fact, the disagreement because it's a lot of fun to have a, a good old argument about something in science or in the humanities uh, and to respect the other person's position even though you disagree with it and to, and to hope, again, that through the process of your debate, something that neither of you had thought of before will emerge. And, and, and that, to me, that process of the emergence of, of something better out of the contest of ideas is what we put hugely at risk, not only with, uh, you know, hate speech legislation, that's, that's a, a part of it, it's a very big part of it, but again, it's this cultural thing of casting people you disagree with as the enemy rather than as part of a process by which we get to better ideas. That's exactly right. And the, I mean, the Education Act that, um, that has the relevant sections around academic freedom, it's focused on two things. One is the, uh, insti well, well, I mean, let's face it, universities, tertiary uh, institutions are often the pointy end of some of these hard democratic or cultural or societal discussions. Mm. And we recognise that with this, cult, with this concept of academic freedom. And it is around, one, the independence of the institution and the autonomy and that not bowing down to the government and the role of the, con you know, the, the conscience of society, which is often holding the state to account, um, or the, you know, because that being where the, a lot of the power lies but also the autonomy of the academic, of the individual academic. And maybe we could um, uh, argue about that our law is perhaps too focused on the institutional rather than the individual academic. But that's really where, as an organisation, as a union, where we need to take the law forward mm. to say that the things that to us seem pretty obvious as reasonable minds can differ or previous generations would say, that the other side is trying to say, no, no, debate's over, yeah. no more, uh, that actually we need to stop that creep of that covering more and more issues mm. and silencing um, often quite large minorities 
or silencing the, contra- uh, the contrarian voices. Well, they may actually be silencing majorities and if the majorities are not well represented in the po- institutions with power. Yeah, possibly. But it is, again, and you look at the, you know, the listener article, is that so let's, the let's, most... So let's, let's just let the, the listeners know what we're talking about here. So um, this was a, a, a letter to the listener signed by one, two, three, four, five, six um, prominent academics. Seven, I think. Seven. Seven, I think, yeah. Seven. Sorry, I went over the... Uh, it goes over the column. That, uh, uh, wh- wh- how would you, how would you summarise it? States that science is something distinct from... Um, Muttering a Māori. Yeah, yeah. And that science so strikes... Ma- ma- Māori from, traditional knowledge, just yeah, in case that, they're international listeners. Uh-huh. <laughs> and, that's, and that science is seeking an object of truth. And that both we should respect but acknowledge that they are often quite different. That they have a different epistemic basis. That that means different ways of coming to the knowledge. Yeah, mm. and the reaction has been quite fierce, um, usually by other academics of, and even the tertiary education union, uh, suggesting that these views are racist or um, I don't think the term bigoted has been used, but um, similar type um, type arguments. And I think that as a society. And I think a lot of it's driven actually from the bad things about social media, is that often the worst interpretation is projected on your opponents. And I use the example. Um, I think I was on another pod- podcast recently. I um, used this. It was um, I forgot the name again. Um, Nationals former finance Goldsmith, Paul Goldsmith. Yes. So Paul Goldsmith is a nerd. Uh, he is a um, historian by uh, by background. Um, he is not the sort of ruthless politician that would sort of um, dog whistle or use code. But I can't remember the exact context. Um, he said about the Prime Minister uh, jumping into some issue that she should quote-unquote stick to her knitting. Mm-hmm. And the Twitterati went absolutely bananas. Because, of course, he, that, naturally he must have been being sexist. Yes, instead of course. Instead of just using a phrase which is... And yeah. this came up at, at work where... A couple of uh, my young staffers were very upset by this, and I said to them, I explained to them the, the the uh, let's say the boomer interpretation of stick to your knitting, or the the, the traditional metaphor that that mm. is, and to my astonishment, they just didn't accept it, and I know Paul well enough to say that um, that he di- I would I would. Be at, put money on that he was not meaning it with a with a double meaning. And I actually learned. I brought this up with him recently, um, and and said I'd used it. And he said I'd actually I was kicking myself. He'd actually used it about Shane Jones only a few days earlier, well, but go. couldn't remember it. Anyway, and, and of course, um, any politician in their right mind wouldn't use it with the double meaning in mind because they'd know that they were going to call. Going to get yeah, of course, all sorts of fury exactly, down on their exactly. heads. <laughs> so so the but the the, the difference is. That for these two young staffers, they didn't care, or they didn't. I explained to them the meaning of all of that, but that didn't let them back down. Their view was more: well, he should have known, and he shouldn't have used it because he should have known that that would be taken in an offensive way. Whereas I swear, when I was in my early twenties as a as a baby lawyer, uh, I remember there being references in court cases to biblical meaning, to biblical metaphors, yeah. that for um, for baby boomers, even if you weren't Christian, you were exposed to enough growing up that they were the it was part of the intellectual furniture. Mm-hmm. That and being embarrassed of not knowing that, and the shame was on me for not knowing it. The cheapest, I'm only 35, so I sound like a grumpy old man. But that seems to have been lost totally. <laughs> that it is this. Well, you should have known. You know, it doesn't. It doesn't matter if even that's not what he was meaning. We should still jump up and down. And I just it blows my mind that that's now that approach is is in the academic world because yeah, so that is the opposite to the collegiality. Yeah, mm. and it, that's it, right. It, I mean, it, it bears saying as well that it, it's very asymmetrical. I mean, what, that's one of the big issues that. We had John Haida on the American psychologist and his organization, Heterodox Academy, which we're both members of, which seeks to sort of further viewpoint diversity and free speech and things in the academy. They've done a lot of studies of academics' political leanings and 
Uh, there are studies also in the UK of this, and you know it's very much slanted to the right, uh, to the left, you know, quite dramatically. And as and John Hyatt was saying, you know, so. it's becoming more and more so. And as John Hyatt was saying, you know, it's not it's not necessarily a problem in itself. It's not it's, we're not saying that you know all left wing people are evil, but it, it sets up a certain dynamic, and, and one of them is this asymmetry that you know if you say something that offends one side, you risk getting into, into deep trouble. It, but there are also things, for example, th there, there are lots of aspects of the modern academy which must be, must be gravely offensive to you if you're, maybe you're an evangelical Christian from Tonga or, or, or wherever and you have certain views and you come to the modern academy. But, but, but th there's very little accommodation made for that, right? So, uh, so anyway, let's just, because uh, we're heading up to an hour, I just wanted to come back to this question. So it's a little bit of a different question th to before where I asked you about, you know, what if you get in trouble for saying something in a lecture? Um, how, let's take the case of um, an academic. This, this has come up in the UK and in the States. You publish a paper, maybe, you know, like Bruce Gilley, you defend colonialism, or uh, like Rebecca Tuval, you write about transracialism and, and transgenderism, and you get in deep trouble for that. Let's imagine that there's a kind of Twitter mob descending on you, um, your superiors are criticizing you, your paper's been retracted, you, might, you think that maybe you're going to be disciplined or investigated by the university, you might even lose your job. So in that scenario, um, if, if there are academics listening to this, uh, what, what, might the, what might the advantages be of, of joining something like the Free Speech Union? What could you do in that, those scenarios? What could you advise? We actually had this. Um, our sort of first sort of foray into a, um, the academic context is, um, we've had a little bit of media on it, but it's a, a chap in Waikato University, um, uh, Raymond, Dr. Raymond Richards, um, who... Uh, in a lecture on, I think it was critical theory, in the context of talking about uh, religious fundamentalism um, of people that view the earth as flat, the moon as smaller than the sun, etc. His uh, the, the earth is in fact smaller than the sun. Say again. The earth is sorry, because it's contrary. <laughs> that's the, the, the sun is smaller than the moon. Oh. Yes, yeah, no. <laughs> um, uh, used in a lecture uh, the term crank. That they're, uh, that they're cranks uh, as a crisp description of um, superstitious belief. And his university um, pulled him aside and said, that's not on. They had a, they had a student, um, despite it being a critical uh, studies uh, course, that that is, that is not on and was told in very um, not, not uncertain terms that he was not to, to use that term. Well... Um, we um, we covered his legal costs. Um, well, sorry, the first round he was t um, he was sort of led off with that sort of don't do it again. But um, uh, with uh, a lawyer's letter that that we'd covered, he said, "No, I'm going to do this again, and you're not going to do anything, mm. and um, and and I'm going to do it to make a point." And it appears that Waikato University is back down. Excellent. Now that's that's a, that's very small victory, but mm. it's that um, that there's a new cop in town, that's and we've right. seen it with local government um, uh, that 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 they are backing down on some other cases that I haven't actually that aren't public uh, yet. But we've got to do that in the academic world and actually command that tolerance. And wh can I ask, uh, when, what was the decisive point there? I mean, I guess it didn't go to court, but. Uh, what was it that convinced the university that they weren't going to win that one? Because they weren't up for the scrap. And mm. our um, brave fellow was willing for the principal to stand to up. To take the for, risk. Yeah, yeah, to, to, yeah, exactly that. And that's what I mean about I'm very concerned, the idea of people. I mean, clearly we need members and we need to grow. Um, you know, you can't save the world if you can't pay the rent sort of thing. But um, I've got to be realistic that we've got very limited resources, and we're going to have to sort of pick and choose what cases to sort of what to take on. Um, but um, we need to take the law forward here, and in a, to a large degree, it will be around those cases that not only that we can win and take the law forward, but are seen to win and take the law forward to say the shot across the bows to the likes of that disgraceful Massey University Vice-Chancellor who yes. bans anyone she disagrees with. Yes. And, Jan Thomas. And yeah. talks unironically about um, tolerance and diversity except for um, any political tolerance or diversity. Uh, yeah. uh, um, uh, 
diversity that um, for people she disagrees with, and actually say, "Look, we'll we'll take you on," yeah. and um, and and that's really what you know what what our um, what the purpose of this organisation is. Now, long term, we um, we would want to be in a situation like the Brits are, where they can take on pretty much any case from um, uh, the, uh, in their wheelhouse in this free speech file mm. uh, or this free speech mission um, to defend um, members because the other side are hunting in packs. You know, you only need to get to sign up to Twitter to see that uh, and that the purpose of a union is that collective action for us to come together and stand for a really important principle. Fortunately, it's a principle that often means you have to um, defend people you don't agree with. But right. that's the test. So there's an argument, you know, even if you're an academic and you think, well, you know, I don't really have any particularly controversial views, although these things can change very fast. Even if you think you're not going to be at risk, right, there's an argument that uh, if you respect this whole idea of intellectual debate and people being free to develop the theories, you know, maybe carefully because we're in a university, so we're trying to do, do things in detail and do sort of deep work. But if you want to defend people's ability to do that in whatever direction uh, strikes them as promising, then I think there's an argument to join a to join an organization like the Free Speech Union. I mean, I, I guess I'll just come out and say that because I, I, I joined it. I've, I've also, I also joined the British one because I'm a Brit British yeah, citizen. James and I were the first two non-British members of the, the, of the, the, the UK. Yeah, yeah I, I thought Union. I might have been in your toe. Uh, no, <laughs> it's actually, you know, it harks back to that cliched maxim about the Nazis, you know, first they came for the Jews and so on. Um, and I was not a Jew. I yeah. was not a Jew, so I did nothing and then... You know, that's right. Eventually, so eventually they came for me, and there was no one left. So f first, yeah. they came for the people who wrote articles in favor of colonialism, and I thought, well, I'm not going to write an article in favor of colonialism. But yeah. then they came for you know, and then yes, it, that's right. It does spiral, and I, I, I find this myself because I sort the of turfs, think, and they came for the yeah. yeah. I, I, I mean, because I always sort of thought, well, I'm, I'll be okay with the left radicalism because I started out, I still do work on ancient Greek democracy. I was always a proponent of direct democracy, and if you go back before Brexit, direct democracy was seen as a, le a radical left thing. But these, the sands can shift very quickly, right? So you never know when, you, when you're going to be in trouble. Yeah. But so if you are an academic and you're interested in the Free Speech Union, can you just say, like, wh wh what can you do? Can you join? What do you get? And or if you're not you an academic with? and you're interested in yep. the Free Speech Union, for that yeah. matter. The one, um, there is actually a case in New Zealand that's probably a better. Um, it never hit court. But that was the Professor Anne Brady in relation to her, her writings on the CCP in China. That's right. And yeah. actually that was quite outrageous what the other universities basically ganging up and making ethical complaints for things that should have actually just been subject of debate. That would be the one that if that came along now, I think we would do our dandest to really uh, hammer um, what Canterbury University tried to do. Now that was all privately, you know, that, that but I, I, I actually don't remember quite how much I, um, is in public and I, I, I can't go into much de detail because I'm scared that I might be breaching confidences. Mm -hmm. But there was someone who very clearly was doing their job as an academic and was being, was universities, was certainly not upholding this view of academic freedom and it was numerous other universities that were very clearly trying to get retribution because they didn't like what an academic was saying. Mm. If we had a case like that, I would be doing my damnedest to make sure that the Free Speech Union were riding to their defence. Yeah. I guess in that case it was um, not so much what we might call the woke left coming for her, but um, some other forces. Yeah, I, I sort of, I'm conscious of the spike that we've talked a lot about that, but actually if we do this as a, you know, the the, the censors have historically been on, on, on the right of the last generation, mm. they're currently on the left, there's some sands that can shift. It depends on the issue. That's right. And actually, we've got to make sure we stand for the principle and that we're not, you know, you, you, you don't convince the, um, the... Don't irritate the mind you wish to persuade. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because if we're harping on that this is a left-wing problem, of which it might be right now... But we it's see not going it right to be now, in 10 years or 20 years. Yeah, that yeah. we'll lose if well, this is turned into and, a left-right and, and rightly so, because it shouldn't be seen as that. It's actually an issue that has brought together yeah. David Seymour and Bomber Bradbury in the same tent. So Yeah, I don't know. If, I don't <laughs> think Bob's, uh, uh, Bomber Bradbury is a member, but he's certainly, um, he's certainly pretty, pr he's pretty he, solid on the he, issue. He published uh, Chris column, Trotter, Matt McCarthy. Uh, this morning. Yep. Mm. Yeah, uh, but yeah, I mean, we're actually trying to. I think over the next few weeks, uh, we've actually got a kind of a glut of interest in the podcast after we um, uh, criticised the new hate speech proposals 
in the newsroom. But after that, we, we I think we're interested in moving into two areas that we don't we haven't talked about enough, which is we, we as you say we've been talking a lot about the threat to free speech from the woke left, which I think is probably the, the most serious one. But then there's this whole the Communist Party of China and the way they managed to infiltrate New Zealand universities in certain ways. And the final thing we won't talk about it today, but just to signal that it's on our minds is actually, quite interestingly, something that the left-wing academics tend to refer to as neoliberalism, just in the sense that the university is very much a brand now. And that can actually have an impact on free speech, too. Of like, I've heard academics, uh, how, how th they've heard from people higher up in the university, be careful with that, you might bring the university into disrepute. So that's also a big, a big threat. So that, that's something for the future. But for now, uh, thank you very much to Jordan Williams for coming on. And if you want to check out the Free Speech Union and maybe even join, then I'll put the link below the video and, and you can click on that. Thanks, Thank James. you so much. Cheers. Cheers.